All right, so today we're going to be working on solving the 1990 um, M2 problem in the AP Physics exam. Um, the problem first starts by stating that a block of mass M slides up the incline shown above with an initial speed of V initial in the position shown. Um, and in part A, basically, we have to figure out if the incline is frictionless, determine the maximum height H, capital H, in which... Um, the block will rise in terms of the given quantities and appropriate constants. So the quantities we basically have um, that are relevant to this problem are m and, I suppose, v initial. So for this, we're just going to use a simple idea of conservation of energy. Since um, the block is already in motion um, when it first starts, and conservation of energy basically just means energy initial equals energy final. Um, let's write that out. Equals energy final. And since this block is already in motion, when we first start looking at it, we the initial energy is kinetic energy. And by the time it comes to um, rest, which is the maximum height to which it will rise, it will only have potential gravitational energy. So that's going to be UG. And to calculate these quantities, we know that K is equal to 1 half M, the mass that we're given, and then the initial speed v initial squared, 1 half mv squared, and the final is m times gravity times the height that it will rise to, which is the variable that we're trying to find. Um, and if we, we can cancel a mass from each side, which means that mass is not relevant to how high this block will rise. It could be one, one kilogram or a million kilograms, it would still be the same. And um, we can isolate h on this side, so we end up with v initial squared over 2, divide g from both sides, 2g equals h. And we're going to define this as our capital H, which will carry on throughout the entire pro uh, throughout the entire problem. So capital H equals v initial squared over 2g. So that's the first part. Now for the second part, um, the problem now states if the incline is rough and with a coefficient of sliding friction mu, determine the maximum height to which the block will rise in terms of this capital H and other given quantities. So in this case, um, we're looking at a force that's, in, uh, that's impacting the motion of the object as it goes up the incline. So to better understand what exactly this force is doing, let's just draw um, just the diagram that's provided, or just a, a free body diagram of sorts, um, kind of. So that's the incline that the block is on. And here's the block of mass m. Here's the angle theta that the incline is slanted at. And so we know that for any object, we have fg that's going straight down to the ground. And fn, which is perpendicular to the surface that it's sliding on. And we have ff, friction, going against the motion of the object. And since um, this, we can break fg up into its components, um, into fgx going this way. That's kind of messy and hard to see, sorry about that. And into FGY, which is um, in line, or basically in the same component as the FN here. And since we see the angle here, we can see that FGY is essentially FG cosine of theta, and FGX is FG sine of theta. It's a bit of a complicated diagram, but we have all the um, components that we need here. And to get that, basically, so now going back to the problem, um, now that we've introduced friction, there's now work being done on the object by the force of friction. And now using the same idea of conservation of energy, um, so the initial energy is K, and the final energy is still potential gravitational energy, UG, but now we're adding on the work that was done on the object, the work of the force of friction. Now to find the work of the force of friction, we know that um, work is equal to the force, force of friction, times the distance that this object travels. Um, so, yeah. And then to find the distance, actually, if we look at this diagram here, let's say, let's draw another smaller, just overall diagram without all the forces. So let's say this is the initial position of the object, and it eventually travels up to this, and this is the height of the object, right? Which is what we're looking for. The distance is this side the amount of distance it covers on the actual incline. And if we look at the theta, the distance here actually equals to h 
over sine of theta, since sine theta is h over d, and by doing some manipulation, we find that distance equals h over sine of theta. So that's the first part of this equation that we need to, but we still don't know exactly how, um, what makes up the force of friction here. So let's do that. So we have the force of friction, and we know that's usually equal to mu f n. So, so with this mu f n, we know mu, uh, mu is a quantity that's given, but we don't know f n yet. But if we look at the free body diagram here, we know that f n um, is the same, and this is by looking at the forces, some of the forces in the y direction, equals, um, since this equals zero, and then we see that f n minus the other y component force, f g y equals zero, which means that they are the same. And we know it's zero because there's no motion in the y direction up and down. It's more merely moving on this direction on the x. So going back, so now we know that fn equals fgy, fgy. We know that equals fg cosine of theta. And we know fg equals, as with all objects, m, the mass of it, times the constant of g, the constant acceleration of gravity, and then cosine theta. So now we have all the pieces that we need to make up our definition of work done by friction. We have the force of friction, which is mu fn mu mg cosine theta times our new definition of d, which is h over sine of theta. And cosine theta over sine theta equals cotangent of theta. So then we have mu mg cotangent of theta times h. And that is um, our final definition of the work done by friction. So now going back to this original conservation of energy equation, um, we have one half mass v initial squared, which is our kinetic energy at the beginning, and then um, for the potential gravitational energy again m g height plus this definition of work mu m g cotangent theta times height. And now, if we were to isolate um, the h's here, we can we can take out, factor out h from this part, half the equation, um, still equals that, and then divide this, um, everything in brackets from both sides, which eventually yields, oh, I forgot to, we can cancel out all the m's from both sides, oops, and then if we move this new canceled um, parentheses equation to the other side, we get v initial squared over 2, times g plus mu g cotangent of theta, and that all equals h. So now that's great. However, we're trying to define, as the equation says, everything in terms of big H here, which we define as v initial squared over 2g. So this looks very similar, uh, but with some extra components. So we're going to factor out g, since it's in both um, of these terms. We're going to get v initial squared over 2g times 1 plus mu cotangent theta equals h. And that looks very familiar to this capital H that we defined in the first part of the problem. The only difference is this new additional term. So we can define this all essentially as h times 1 over mu, uh, 1 over mu cotangent theta plus 1. I don't know why I reversed the order there. That's kind of weird. But yes. That is, that is everything that we have here, since h is equal to v initial squared over 2g. So that's the second part of this problem. Now moving on to part uh, c. So now we're looking at a slightly different object that's moving up. It's still the same concept, but now it is a thin hoop of the same mass m, but with a radius of capital R, moving up the incline shown, with still with an initial speed of the um, initial and the position shown. So the only difference here is that now when we think about conservation of energy, we have to think about both rotational and translational energy. Translational is sort of the motion of the object as it moves, which is what we were looking at before. The K um, in the first part is this is translational kinetic energy. But rotational is the energy um, that spins the hoop this way. So... Um, if we look at part C, if the incline is rough and the hoop rolls up the incline without slipping, determine the maximum height to which 
the hoop will rise in terms of capital H, again, this capital H that we found in part A, um, and other given quantities. So first, let's set up our conservation of energy equation, kinetic energy rotational and kinetic energy plus kinetic energy translational, which are both present in the initial state of the object of the hoop, equals, again, we end with only potential gravitational energy, since that's what we're stopping at. Um, and to do so, we first have to break up, we know what this is, but we have to break up the kinetic energy rotational, and we know that is one-half times the inertia times omega squared. That, that's the um, velocity, um, uh, the, circu the circular velocity that's uh, the, happening here. And uh, omega, we know, equals to velocity over the radius. So we can break that up. And we know inertia, the inertia of a thin hoop, of a, of a hoop, is simply m times r squared. That's very simple, since all the mass is distributed evenly from the center, from the center of mass in the middle. And um, once we plug those both back into our kinetic, uh, our kinetic energy rotational, we get one half inertia m r squared, and then this omega squared, so v squared over r squared, and you find that the r squares cancel out. So essentially, in this very specific instance with the hoop, the kinetic rotational energy is the exact same, um, and I'll have to mention this is all v initial, it is the exact same as the translational kinetic energy that we've been working with throughout this entire problem. So if we go back to this initial equation, one half m v initial squared, which is rotational, and translational is the exact same, one half m v initial squared equals u g, which is again m g h. Again, we can cancel out the m's from both sides, and then these two add together, one half of v initial squared plus one half of v initial squared equals one v initial squared. It's so just v initial squared equals g h, and isolate h, we get v initial squared over g. And again, we have to define this in terms of the capital H that we found over here. So to do that, we notice that the only difference is that there's a two on the bottom. This is just one half of this value. So this is just equal to two capital H. And that's the value of um, the height, the height when um, this hoop is going to its maximum. So now looking at the final part, D. So now we're seeing if the incline is frictionless, determine the maximum height to which the hoop will rise in terms of capital H and the given quantities, that other the variables that we've been working with throughout the entire problem. And um, here, we're going back to basically what we did in part A, except that we're working with kinetic of rotational energy. So kr initial equals the final of ug, the gravitational potential energy. And we know what kr already is. We calculated that here, so we don't need to go through all these steps. So that's still 1 half mv initial squared. So what we find equals mgh. What we find is that this is just the same as part a. Nothing has changed. h is going to come out um, to cancel out the m's. It's going to come out to v initial squared over 2g, again, just like in part a. So we find that the h here is just equal to capital H that we found in part A. This is the exact same instance because in this problem with the thin hoop, uh, the kinetic rotational energy and the kinetic translational energy both happen to be one and the same. Um, so part D essentially is just the same thing as part A. Um, and so that's the end of this problem. Uh, we've looked at a bunch of different types of work in energy and looking at how friction does work um, that impacts how far or how high um, an object will rise on an incline, and yeah, that's the problem.